We had uh, this, uh, this uh, interesting conference of knots and links uh, form to function, so uh, be interesting first to hear from our panel uh, a preliminary account of what they think are the problems ahead and what they think about uh, difficulties, open problems, so forth. So, Ken, please, to you. The, the talks that uh, struck my fancy, as it were, was the knights, knots, knights and knots, no, knots and light, um, and the ability to um, construct uh, knotted light, framed knotted light, knotted links, catenanes. Uh, it made me uh, think of the famous licorice Wallace theorem to the effect that uh, one, can one can construct every three-dimensional manifold by a framed link. Got me thinking about quantum knots, quantum optics, and whether or not somehow we could uh, solve questions about classifications of three-dimensional manifolds using such methods. Do I get only one pass, or mm -hmm. am I to... Uh, well, so there's, there's a place to start. So let's classify all three manifolds um, using quantum computing based on quantum optics and knotted and linked framed knots. Okay, very well. Uh, Keith, your turn. Okay, well, by way of introduction, um, I found that the people at this uh, conference seem to me to fall into two categories. The uh, discrete, should say the dis discrete and the indiscreet, but I really mean the dis discrete and the discrete and the continuous. Um, I'll give an example. It's a problem I, I discussed with uh, Rob Kusner yesterday on the bus trip, and I must say, having a bus trip, an excursion, is a terribly important part of a conference because it's when a lot of the communication and interaction actually takes place. And it was a wonderful excursion we had yesterday, as I'm sure you'll all agree. Well, the problem actually was stimulated by Ken's uh, lecture, which really seemed to, from what I understood of it, uh, was concerned with detecting properties like chirality in a distribution of mass density. I mean, there was a random quality to it, I mean to the <laughs> distribution <laughs> as well as to the lecture. <laughs> but um, so this raises the problem. Suppose you have a density distribution that's a continuous function of position, perhaps inside a sphere. And you want some, you know, you look at this function of th three coordinates, x, y, z, and you ask yourself, how can I detect what measure? Uh, I mean, this question came up at the end of the lecture, I think. What sort of a measure, possibly some kind of integral over the sphere uh, involving this density function, will detect whether it, it is chiral or not, whether there is any net chirality in this? Now, the continuous people would, uh, will, would deal with this as a continuous function of position. The discrete among you would say, well, let's specialize to... Uh, a distribution of a finite number of point masses, a certain configuration, and say, how can we determine whether there is chirality in that distribution, that configuration? It's obvious if you take a right-handed helix and you take enough particles along a right-handed helix, maybe 10 particles distributed evenly along a helix, then it's easy to, uh, to see whether it's right-handed or left-handed as far as the configuration is concerned. But again, um, it becomes an interesting mathematical problem. How do you just pin it down and how many particles do you need before you can determine that uh, the, the configuration is chiral or not? So this was an interesting puzzle that uh, Rob and I have been uh, puzzling over since then and uh, we hope to announce a result soon, so that's something you see. Open, pr it's an open problem. <laughs> it's an op open problem, and it's uh, something for the future. <laughs> okay, uh, So I guess does this work? So I will start with something actually quite big, probably not behind the corner, but uh, so w one concern in the um, say 
pure mathematics uh, 3D topological community was that uh, the subject would kind of die after Perlman, because after all the you know the biggest result around was taken away by methods that do not belong to us and um, and actually I think that this so I, of course it's going to be extremely difficult and I'm not sure if it's going to happen at all but I think um, one of the main issues remains the proof of the geometrization and including Poincaré conjecture that uh, is done by methods that uh, uh, shade light about uh, really the topology and not through analysis. Um, yes, sure. We first uh, and we uh, do it and then we go to comments, of course. So I, I don't know how the young people think. I'm sort of, you know, uh, as Ken put it, we look around and uh, <laughs> we're some of the oldest guys around. I mean, whoa. But it's great to see all the young people here and I'm hoping that they get the point of view. I think this, been, this conference, Renzo did all the work and there's been a great variety of very interesting talks from lots of different subjects. And I think as a topologist, uh, you can see that you've got the foot in the door. It's like being a vacuum salesman. You've got your foot in the door and lots of different scientific areas like topological optics and you know the interaction between topology and molecular biology is growing stronger all the time and the interaction between topology and magnetohydrodynamics and fluid dynamics I think is growing stronger all the time as well there are lots of extremely interesting problems three spaces a complicated place and one dimensional filaments are the things that are investigating the complexity and uh, I personally became interested in reconnection events uh, that happen certainly in recombination of molecular biology, but they happen lots of places and they seem to be very interesting. The onset of turbulence and the, sort of the cascade down to sort of very small rings from a sort of turbulent situation is through reconnection events. So I think reconnection is something that's very important that needs to be looked at by everybody. Um, I'm also interested in, in terms of molecular biology, things that are happening in confined volumes. I mean, the cell is a confined volume, the DNA in the nucleus is very tightly packed, and the question is how does, how does biology get around this very tight packing? You'd think that things would get so much worse that there's no way to solve the problems, but somehow Mother Nature does it, and we're not privy to the secrets. Um, so. Geometric structures naturally live on pieces of non-compact three-dimensional manifolds. Some of us think we live in a compact three-dimensional manifold at any given moment of time, whatever that means, but some of us think it might be non-compact and it could be pretty wild, you know, some tremendous like iterated whitehead nonsense. It's out very of hard thing. to understand what goes on in the compact case and the finite volume case and there are people thinking about the harder case which is the infinite volume case, but, uh, but it's a lot lot harder, a lot, lot harder. So, and I think it is something that, that is something that people need to look at. It's, it's something for the future, definitely. The solution will be to look at the dimension above, because four dimensional manifolds are really strange. And maybe, maybe one, you could get a more topological proof of, of, the, of the Poincaré conjecture by looking at how, what sort of, what sort of um, four manifold, what sort of four manifolds can bound, the way around, what sort of three manifolds can be the boundary of four manifolds. And you already see that, for example, with the interplay between contact geometry and symplectic geometry. So I, th I, that would be a, I think that would be a natural place to, um, for them. Well, yeah, I mean, it, it was tried in the past. I mean, you oh, have, you have hi higher versions of Poincaré that are actually false, but you know the obstructions too. <coughs> and uh, that was done by looking uh, yeah, yes, but, but, one but, dimension up. Yeah, but what I'm saying is that in the last, uh, it seems to me that in the last few years that uh, there's, for example, really a really strong relationship between tight contact structures and symplectic structures. So maybe that could be expanded to, I don't know, maybe relate to yeah. hyperbolic manifolds into if if a uh, if, uh, sorry if a three if a, a hyperbolic three manifold is the boundary of some four manifold then I mean, there might be some something there that might help three dimensions I mean one of the techniques to study orientable three manifolds has been contact structures and for those of you who know what they are you do that for physicists they look like cholesteric liquid crystals they're basically structures where at every point there's a either a director or a two plane. But uh, if you think of the director locally as a vector field, the curl of that vector field dotted with the field is everywhere non-zero, everywhere positive, say. So the helicity, as Keith would say, the helicity of 
the field that's perpendicular to these planes has, has non-zero helicity. And every three manifold supports them. J John Etnire, who we tried to get to come to last week's thing but didn't come, uh, one of his, is Rafael here? Rafael here? Yes, Rafael's not here, one of his students uh, is here. Has been trying to understand when hyperbolic three manifolds admit tight contact structures. So I, I you know, tight's a kind of technical thing, but uh, 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 apparently that's even an interesting open question. The interaction between the Ramanian geometry, these complete structures are uh, on compact manifolds even, when hyperbolic ones admit these special types of contact structures, which from a physical point of view are cholesteric liquid crystals filling up the manifold. So the crystal that's always twisting in some direction, positive, for example. I want to take up something that DeWitt said um, about the importance of understanding reconnection processes. I mean, one of the one of the very interesting problems in fluid mechanics is when you have a reconnection of two vortex tubes, um, r the writh, it may be it may be two link tubes that. Uh, that are driven together and, and reconnect to form one tube. The question is, does the, uh, does the linking helicity convert to entirely to twist helicity? In other words, is the, uh, is the helicity conserved in this process? Although it's an energy dissipating process, it's, uh, one of, it's a very central problem. And um, DeWitt has some examples in some physical systems where it seems that helicity is conserved. But we haven't got a proof of that in the context of uh, uh, fluid mechanics, where the reconnection is governed by viscous diffusion. But this problem is actually closely connected with one the absolutely central problem in vortex dynamics at the moment. It's one of the clay problems. So it is really a problem looking to the future as yet unsolved. This is the question of whether, given an initially smooth vorticity field, perhaps confined, um, in some uh, localized region, and you let it evolve according to the Navier-Stokes equations. I mean, you could do the Euler problem, but Navier-Stokes is the clay problem. That uh, as small viscosity as you like, the question is: Does the vorticity remain finite for all time, or is it possible? Are there any initial conditions for which the vorticity blows up uh, at finite time? called the finite time singularity problem. Now, um, I think that knot theory may have a, a part to play in this because you can imagine the vorticity field as a tangle with the four vortex tubes emerging from the tangle region. And if you pin down these vortex tubes, for example, on two plane boundaries and simply move the boundaries, drag them apart, the volume occupied by the vortex tubes remains finite. So in the tangle region, it's quite conceivable that um, a singularity must develop because they're dra the fluid drains out and they have to collapse and the topology is conserved. So I think this is a very, very interesting and challenging problem. Find out what, what is the nature of the tangle that might lead to this behavior. I say there's a million dollars. Uh, I would on. like to add one problem which is close to this and may be easier than Navier Stokes is to, f to study uh, topological invariance and vortices in superfluid helium, for example, in uh, films and so. Uh, and in this case, uh, vorticity and uh, entangles of line defects, maybe this, this is the nature of uh, transition from. Uh, ordinary <coughs> movement to turbulent system. So it's more and more and more tangled, tangled, and tangled. So this is maybe the question which is interesting to study. One of the questions that has arisen in, during the course of uh, these lectures, actually two points. Uh, first, um, curiosity as to whether or not there exist what I might call hydrophilic knots, that is, um, knots which when connected some with another knot uh, and evolved to their uh, rope length minimizing position sort of uh, embrace, cover, protect uh, as a mother might uh, the, the some man knot from the exterior. So you might think of the interior knot as sort of a hydrophobic knot and the, uh, and the hydrophilic knot 
uh, evolving into to um, to uh, sort of uh, encompass or embrace or or this um, this uh, in a tight knot kind of configuration. Mobius uh, energy picks out the most symmetric trefoil in the three sphere. So, for example, and you know the early experiments that Rob and I did numerically with Mobius energy for all rational knots, it seems to very nicely break it up into its mm -hmm. continued fraction tangle picture with you know chains of twists and and so I think you know you have to you have to get your eyes used to the fact that it's Mobius invariant so that the Euclidean picture you see is one of many but it's those minimizers are very nice shapes. These uh, ideal uh, configurations are uh, really opening up uh, so many interesting problems. Um, the importance uh, we know in the circle packing is uh, is uh, the from the the measures of the of the empty spaces and the cusps that are formed, and here we see cusps uh, not in 2D but in 3D, and I believe that adds uh, quite a bit of uh, difficulty, but uh, of also of, uh, very very fascinating. I think uh, I was uh, actually also quite captured by the uh, one uh, one feature that is uh, clearly coming becoming very very prominent is. Uh, kind of a visible effect of the hierarchical complexity or structures that are emerging. I was uh, very fascinated by, by a number of talks. Uh, I have uh, personally in my research uh, interest in uh, relationship between energy and complexity and by just noticing what uh, Ken and others uh, showed us uh, uh, knots uh, that are within knots, etc., made me wonder. On one hand, purely in terms of descriptive topology, if uh, we may think of uh, invariants that are invariant that are encapsulating other invariants in a kind of hierarchical structures, uh, so to speak, uh, for example, polynomials that will lead to a more general polynomials able to capture other features in this kind of hierarchical way. And uh, for me, this description would uh, go uh, well uh, with uh, energy. Uh, so I wonder if Ken would like to comment on this. Uh, well, oh, thank you, Renzo. I would have, but I've just crossed it off my list because I think you described the situation uh, very, very, very well. I, f I find myself looking at this these hierarchy of, hierarchy of structures of knots within knots that you saw so beautifully illustrated in Eric's lecture. Uh, he is a co-author, so I need to uh, publicly acknowledge that I'm uh, not unprejudiced about uh, this stuff, but. Uh, I think there are many problems in this whole arena, one of which is just recognition of the structure. How, do you, how can one recognize, articulate, capture, express, communicate these structures? Uh, and then ultimately, of course, and this is in line with uh, thinking about um, the, the Dennis, uh, Dennis lecture on knots and lights, how do, you, um, how do you control it? How do you manipulate it? How do you exploit it, if you wish? Um, we see in papers now these folks doing um, single molecule experiments and laser tweezers and we're able to do the nano bio engineering of tying knots in just about every darn thing I think in this week's or last week's perhaps science. There was an absolutely fabulous article in this regard. I think DeWitt you mentioned it perhaps. Uh, th this, the notion that one can do these sorts of things uh, is I find really challenging in terms of thinking about how to make, how to capture and, and exploit seems, you know, from Wisconsin it's a, like a dirty word, exploit, um, use for the good of humankind uh, these structures, control them uh, and uh, do some amazing things with them. So I think we need the mathematics, we need the concepts, I think uh, there are many things about this that provide opportunities for the future that you've pointed out, Renzo, and this, this complexity of structure that we see. Uh, I look at the knot tables very differently now, uh, and I hope uh, others will soon. Well, um, Renzo has asked me to read a poem that was written by James Clark Maxwell. <laughs> 
Uh, and it's on P.G. Tate's work on knots and links. P.G. Tate was Peter Guthrie Tate. So the Peter in this poem is uh, Peter Guthrie Tate. Of course, Peter equally is an international name. It's uh, Piotr in some languages. <laughs> Pierre, Pedro, Pietro, etc., etc. Um, and he says the introduction is uh, that Tate had established a new vocabulary and gave precise meanings to such terms as knottiness, benottedness, plate, link, lock, etc. So this is what Maxwell wrote. It's called The Cat's Cradle Song by a Babe in Knots. Peter the Repeater plaited round a platter, slips of silvered paper, basting them with batter. You may remember this is what uh, Rob Kushner did in his lecture. <laughs> <laughs> Flip him, slit him, twist him. Uh, lop looped laps of paper, setting out the system by the bones of Napier. Napier, uh, Edinburgh mathematician, I'm glad to say, the inventor of logarithms. Clear your coil of kinkings into perfect plating, locking loops and linkings interpenetrating. Why should a man be knighted, be duped, be fooled, besotted, call not full knittings plighted, not naughty, but be knotted? It's monstrous, horrid, shocking, beyond the power of thinking, not to know interlocking is no mere form of linking. But little uh, Jackie Horner will teach you what is proper, Pitch. him in his corner, your silver and your copper. James Clark Maxwell. Thank oh, very good. <laughs> Thank you. Well, uh, I, I just should like to add uh, that uh, silver and copper were the very first ways uh, Tate uh, used to, uh, you know, to uh, uh, decide if a crossing was under or over, was just placing silver or copper coins uh, uh, nearby the corner. Then uh, in the very first uh, uh, diagrammatic uh, sketch of his uh, very first original uh, tabulation, you will see little dots. So, because he couldn't, of course, uh, at the time, he had to identify a way to decide if it was a silver or a copper. So, he decided to put one uh, little dot uh, for one coin and two for the other. So, the plus and minus signs came uh, uh, later, but Tate, of course, we know, uh, saw the possibility to maintain a topology while drawing a diagram on a plane. So, actually, yes. Uh, do it. Would you like to either give a close or uh, comment further? Well, what I'd like to do is, on behalf of everybody here, thank you, Renzo, for one terrific conference. All right. Yes, okay.